a Linux technical consultant working in Auckland, New Zealand, where he works with server architecture and web applications. After 12 years IT experience, he is currently working, on, uh, working for Open Systems Specialists in New Zealand, providing Linux and Unix managed services. Outside of work, Dan advocates for improved public transport, with his most frequent freedom, freedom of information target being Auckland Transport, Auckland's state-owned public transport provider. He also has a keen interest in board games, travel, and enjoying some time in the great outdoors to take a break from the computer screens. Uh, Dan's talk is entitled Prying Open Government and an Introduction to Freedom of Information. And you're all good, so I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Thank Dan. you. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Dan, and this will take you to my website, and I'll put it up later if you do want my slides from this talk. Uh, I'm from Auckland. This is my fourth Linux Conf, and I did want to put a disclaimer at the beginning here, saying I'm not a lawyer. We are talking about laws, but I am not involved in discussing the specifics of the laws. I'm more telling you, as ordinary citizens, how to use them. So I'm an IT professional by day, and I do use Freedom of Information Act as part of my personal research and to try and improve uh, the way that government communicates with us and advocate for change. So freedom of, informa of information is effectively a set of laws that are available throughout the world in over 90 countries. You can use it to request from a government organization any specific document or specific information that you might want, and unless they have a good reason for keeping it from you or for keeping it secret, they have to provide that to you. If they don't, there is usually an ombudsman that can actually assist you in challenging the government's decision to reject that. You might want to use this for projects, journalism, or any campaigning that you want to do for change. So, being an Australian audience mostly here, I have covered some of the differences between Australia and New Zealand. It's actually the one law that I've found that gives New Zealanders more rights in Australia than the, any equivalent law in New Zealand gives Australians. So, in Australia, any person can make a request, whether that be someone in Australia, someone anyone else, anywhere else in the world, or an organization can all make a request. For New Zealand law, you can only make a request if you are a New Zealander, either physically present there, a citizen, or an organization based in New Zealand. Uh, there are some slight differences as to what you can request specifically and how much you get for free before the organization is allowed to cha charge you as well. So New Zealand's nice and convenient because we have one uh, central law, the Official Information Act, that allows you to request information from any government, uh, central government body. And we also have a second law called the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act, which allows you to request information from any local council or local body, including uh, Chatham Islands, which is over on the right there, that sometimes people forget is part of New Zealand. Um, and then I discovered that we have Australia, which has states, territories, and guess what? A different law for every single one of them. So if you want to request for a specific state, you request that under the state law or territory law. The good news is there is a law covering every single one of them, and they are pretty much similar. As I mentioned, this does go wider than just Australia and New Zealand. Anything in dark green there has some sort of freedom of information law. And it pretty much matches the countries where you'd expect some sort of freedom of the press. It was mostly journalists that pressed for these sort of laws. So if journalists have freedoms, then they tend to have accomplished some sort of form of these laws. So effectively, the process that you need to go through if you want to make a request is to make that request, and then the body that you are actually making that request to does most of the work. So they will first go and acknowledge that request. Depending on whether they understand it or not, they may come back to you for clarification, and eventually you'll get a response. Each law will have a specific time frame as to how long they have to take before they can respond. And then once again, it goes back to you to use the information. If you aren't happy, you can go to the ombudsman for a review. Uh, occasionally, it does happen that an organization doesn't have the data directly on hand and they want longer. Most of the laws also provide for an extension request that allows the organization to come back to you within the original time frame and say, hey, we don't have the information yet. We would like to take this long to provide it to you. So I'm going to present a little story about why I discovered this law, how I went about using it 
one of the first times I used it uh, to do some research. And it was because something was wrong on the internet. That something happened to be Auckland Transport, and it was a few statements that they've made on their website. So Auckland Transport is effectively our public transport provider. They also handle roading in Auckland, and they have these little things called at-hop cards, which is one of these that you see up here. You can buy these as either prepaid cards or load monthly passes on, and you can have as many of them you like. You can have more than one. So, the Auckland Transport website tells you a little bit about what that is. They also tell you that if you're using one of these, you're probably going to save money. Uh, you can also load concession fares if you happen to be a student and things like that. So, at first glance, the website looks relatively good, but I'm a bit nitpicky and I don't like it when they put question, oh, that's gone, yep. Uh, questions without a question mark. I'm also a big proponent for the Oxford <laughs> comma. Um, so I've made a few suggested corrections here. But the main part of this that I wanted to investigate was actually the discount. So it says at least 20% discount off single trip cash fares, excluding a whole pile of things. And it was actually the Skybus one that caught my attention. Um, Skybus in Auckland is now owned by the same company that does Skybus Melbourne, so you might be familiar with them. Um, they recently installed this, and I discovered that if you pay for a return trip by cash, you pay $28. If you pay for it on your at top card, you pay 32. So, yay, savings. Um, some of you may have figured out that that is a negative $4 saving. Uh, the light blue bars are the per trip costs if you book 10 trips. So if you book online, you actually save even more. So you're looking at seven or, seven or so dollars that you're going to be paying extra over the long term if you're using this nice prepaid hop card. So. I made a request to the Auckland Transport uh, Authority, and so this would go under the local government's law, uh, as Auckland Transport is part of Auckland Council. I asked them a series of questions, effectively about how many trips people have made, and asked them how many unique at-top cards have actually made a trip on Airbus Express, which was the previous branding for Skybus. That, to me, was a relatively simple question, but as we'll see shortly, apparently not to a council. Um, and a couple of other questions as well, just for interest's sake. Um, so, mentioning before that you can have more than one at hop card, does everyone understand or think they understand what a unique at hop card might be? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I got back was day zero, straight away. I got back an acknowledgement from them. So that fulfills the first thing they're supposed to do. It has a couple of generic things. It's not specific to the information request I actually made. They obviously haven't read it at this stage because it came back pretty quickly. Um, day two, they came back for clarification because apparently they don't know what a unique at top card might be, so they came back and asked me. They also nitpicked a little bit because under the law, you're supposed to be specific as to exactly the information that you want. So I didn't give them a time period for the information that they wanted. So despite the fact it had only been installed for two months, they wanted me to tell them that I wanted that information for two months. You know, it does give you the idea that you can actually, at this stage even, go to the ombudsman, and they've got a nice little paragraph, and they're telling you that. Um, it also references the law that they're acknowledging it under. And the important part is because they've asked for clarification, at day two, the timer actually stops here until I respond. So I clarify, an app cop card. If you have more than one of these, each one is unique. Each unique card will have a trip history. It's clear. <laughs> um, and I also told them, yes, this has only been installed for, at that time, two months. Therefore, I want all of the data. They accepted that, as far as I could tell, so now we wait. So, in New Zealand, the time frame to answer is 20 working days. Would anyone like to make a guess at how many days they took? 20! <laughs> <laughs> of course they did. Government organizations are not known for providing things ahead of deadlines. So on exactly working day 20, they sent me the response. And if I remember correctly, it was at pretty much the end of the working day. I think they were just trying to save themselves the extra work for actually uh, asking for an extension. 
So their response effectively came in three parts. The first part is boring. It's an acknowledgement and reiteration of my request. They effectively repeated back to me all of my questions and all of the information that I gave them in the clarification. Part two, I was actually really impressed with because it gave me a whole set of actual answers. They were specific answers to the questions that I made and they answered all of them. Now, from talking to other people that have used these laws, this is relatively rare and usually means you've done a really good job of actually phrasing your questions in such a way that they can give you specific answers. Some of them they didn't have information for, like they didn't actually have any forecasting data, so there was no specific answer to give, but at least they gave a specific answer saying we have nothing here. Um, I was really happy with that. The first thing I found interesting about this is the numbers don't quite add up, so the, the number of unique hot cards plus the number of people that had made subsequent trips doesn't quite equal the number of trips that have been made on there. So that tells me somewhere along the lines people are probably making more than one trip or have made trips outside of the one month boundary. The last part that they always include, or most organizations do, is a summary of your legal rights. So once again, this references the law that they've used to respond under. It gives them your website where you can try and make a complaint, but they will probably not pay attention to that, and the how to use the ombudsman, effectively. So this is pretty much the standard form that you'll get back for any response that's actually successful to an organization that is actually paying attention to them and complying with the laws. Then it's kind of over to you. So I posted this on a blog post, which I had a social media author help me out with. It got picked up by a kind of independent news group that doesn't really have their own journalists and, and publishes things online. There are a lot of articles on here. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. Three thousand dollars of missed savings wasn't quite enough to attract the attention of the mainstream media, but that's okay. It was a good request, and it's a great one to explain with. So obviously I'm not the only person that uses this. Uh, I discovered a lot of media outlets actually use this for gathering regular statistics. They have form-based requests that they submit every month or every quarter or every year to get specific figures. Um, some of the ones I was quoted by the New Zealand Herald are listed up there. Um, and they also use it for their campaigning from a media's perspective. So we had an interesting case uh, last year in New Zealand um, where a policeman was contacted by one of our members of parliament into, in regards to one of the cases that he was investigating. So it turned out that he was investigating one of the party donors for our national party. Um, he was giving money and then was being kind of reviewed around some assault charges and the particular MP ended up resigning because all of the emails that he was sending to the police got requested under the Official Information Act and published by the New Zealand Herald. Uh, he is no longer a minister, he is still an MP though. Um, so things like this can actually be useful if you have specific campaigns that you want to run and particular pieces of information that you want to gather. Uh, so there is actually also open source software that can help you make these requests. I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about that. Oliver Tally is the main one that I'm aware of. Uh, this is commonly installed throughout the world. There are a number of countries, including Australia or New Zealand, that run free of charge access to Oliver Tally. You can go onto their websites and make requests through there. It's a Ruby on Rails application. It's got a Postgres backend, and it communicates to the organizations mostly by email. So effectively, it will take your, your web form-based submission, turn it into an email, send it off to the, to the organization that you're making the request to, and it'll come back. It's got an API, which is JSON. Everyone loves JSON. Um, <laughs> and can be customized with themes and colors. You can make it your own and make it pretty. So the web interface effectively lists some of the organizations that you might want to make a request to. And it might not be clear that the Glowcard is a fictional organization here, so I'll point that out. Um, you effectively select the authority that you want to make an organization request to. It will automatically decide what law that comes under because the administrator will do a good job of setting this up and it will send off the request to them by email. So you type in your request into a, into a web form. Um, it tells you a little bit about the organization that you're making the request to. And off it goes. In this case, your freedom of information request has been sent. So what actually goes on in the background here is Oliver Tally actually turns that request into a from email address. 
that it then picks up and processes replies from. So every single request gets a unique email address generated. So you need to do some Postgres magic in the background to, um, to, to store the replies and, it, uh, yeah, magic happens. Um, the to address is listed by the organization and it can be updated by the Alavitali administrator or uh, on request effectively if they, if they do end up being black holed. So that's actually set up by in, in the software. Eventually, you'll be able to see your replies and any updates to the case. They'll all go into the website, um, and they can be accessed either through the web page or through the API. So the good thing about this is the API is pretty easy to find. If you have a particular URL on the website, you can pretty much be guaranteed that you'll find an API by just putting .json on the end. So for instance, this page here, where we actually have the information about the authority, you tag on .json, and voila, JSON comes out. It's a read API, it gives you the home page of the authority and the description, and how many requests have been uh, made to it. So it's fairly, fairly easy to, to navigate the API. Um, so obviously, you can actually go and install the software yourself. I do have it available on my laptop in a little vagrant VM, so I'm quite happy to describe any particular areas or show off some UI locations in this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of installations that are publicly available. So FYI is the New Zealand one. That is effectively, yeah, you can make a request to a New Zealand uh, organization if you are a New Zealander. So if you're an Australian living here, sorry, not necessarily gonna get a reply unless you tell them and they are convinced that you are a New Zealander. Um, but even the New Zealanders and global people in the room, you're quite welcome to use the Australian one and they are still legally obliged to apply. Uh, this, one of the original installations of this was in the UK, so the software developers were working quite closely with the, with the British administrators to do this. Uh, my website, if you want to read up more about the Auckland Transport request that I made, it's in full on my blog, um, and it's linked through there to the original, uh, the original request there. If you don't know what the Glocal is, I would suggest going to welcometonightvale.com. Some of you snick it, so I suspect some of you know what it is. All hail. I do need to thank OSS, they're my employer. They provided me with the time to actually come up here and to write my talk in work hours, so I was very grateful for that. They also paid for my ticket to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank the New Zealand Herald who provided me with some of the information about how they use the requests. Um, I discovered that journalism has politics involved even internally, so they weren't able to tell me how many requests or a bulk of their requests provided, but it is the sort of uh, stuff that they apparently keep secret even from each other. Uh, and obviously the Miniconf organizers and the rest of LinuxConf. So I'm running actually a couple of minutes early also, so we have plenty of time for questions, I think. And while that's up there, if you did want any of the slides, feel free to scan. Cool, any questions? <laughs> Are you currently working on anything related to freedom of information in addition to the transport one? Uh, I don't have anything specific going on at the moment. I am, by doing this talk, it actually reminded me how long it had been since I made the Auckland transport request. So I suspect the savings there that could have been made if they programmed in a return trip and things like that have built up by now, so I'm probably going to make the, effectively the same request again and see if it's a bigger number and therefore can attract more media attention this time. So it's, it's an area I'm going to revisit. Mm. Um, just an aside, I know some other people, a lot of people are using the system. Some of them have tried requesting source code as well. I know there's one in Australia that got spoke about a, a previous Linux comp that they are still trying to go through the ombudsman to get a set of source code. As far as I know, no one's managed to get source code out of a government organization based on this yet, but theoretically should be possible. Um, it, mine, mine isn't really a question, it's more of a, a comment. Um, I was a federal public servant. Mm. Uh, we have dealt with these things before. If you're putting in 
these sorts of requests, be mindful that somebody is on the other end doing the work. They may well come back and say, okay, we can give you that information, but it's going to cost you $250,000. Mm. <laughs> we have had a number of those requests uh, when I was working there. <clears throat> One involved all the correspondence between the federal government, a particular union and particular industry segments in relation to a particular thing that was going on. I'm not going to say exactly what it was, but uh, yeah, the, the request itself was monumental and probably would have employed somebody doing that alone for the next year and a half. Mm. 